you, and thank you all for coming to uh, this introductory session on uh, New York's new green building laws. And what I want to do tonight is um, help you understand how large co-ops, condos, and uh, rental buildings have to comply with the new laws. Uh, when I say large, I mean um, 50 units or more approximately. Um, so how many of you in the room, just so I get a feel for you, how many, how many of you live in co-ops or condos or multifamily uh, rentals? Okay, good. <laughs> um, I see Mary's here, and she's the president of a board of Georgetown U. That's a very uh, big uh, co-op uh, complex in Queens, and she's done a lot of energy efficiency improvements. And I see Josh from Jor Jordan from uh, Power Concepts, and uh, Matt from uh, Association for Energy Affordability. So we have some energy auditors in the room as well. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about, about tonight is relevant for all three types of multifamily buildings. Um, and I'd, as, um, as uh, Maddie said, there, I'm going to use some technical terms. So um, if you did not understand something I'm saying, I'd rather you not go through the whole presentation and not understand. So raise your hand if there's something I'm saying that, you, you know, a technical term or something that you don't understand. Um, but by the end of the evening, you should um, understand most of it. Um, so. Let, I, I think it's easier to start uh, talking about the laws if we understand the policy behind it. So let's talk about that to start. Oh, of course, I just turned the screen off. Um, uh, that way, okay. Um, so what I'm going to cover tonight are uh, basically the background of the green building laws. That's where I'll touch on the, on the, uh, the policy. Um, we'll go into some detail about what each of the laws are. There's going to be four I'm going to talk about tonight, but two I'm going to really focus on that affect you. Uh, for as uh, multifamily uh, residential building uh, owners or renters. And uh, I'm going to talk about the, the benefits of early compliance. And then at the end, we'll touch on all the financing options that you have available to you. So first, we'll start with the background on the um, green building laws and why did they come about. We live in New York City. We think of ourselves as a green city because we have this incredible public transportation system. But if you look at the carbon emissions of New York City compared to the national average, we're actually twice as high as other cities. And that's primarily because of our buildings. We live in very tall buildings. And when I say carbon emissions or CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions, I'm kind of meaning the same thing. So uh, it, they did a study, the city did a study, and they discovered that 80% of our carbon emissions in New York City actually come from our buildings. We, we might think it comes from cars, but it, it really doesn't. 39% comes from residential buildings. And um, New York has a goal of uh, reducing our greenhouse gas, em gas emissions by 30% by 2030. And uh, you may have heard a lot of um, talk and discussions about new green building, lead buildings, new buildings. Battery Park City has a lot of them. Um, but we're never going to make a dent in carbon emissions with new buildings. We really have to tackle the existing buildings. This is the breakdown of our energy usage in New York City in uh, 2007. And as you can see, only 23% of it um, is used for transportation. That's because we're very efficient when it comes to transportation. But the rest of it, 77, is, is from buildings. And most of that is from our large buildings. The green and uh, brownish uh, pies are for uh, large buildings, which includes lighting and hot water, lighting and heating, um, and appliances and cooling. Um, now, the reason we're going to tackle the existing buildings is because by um, 2030, uh, New York City projects that 80%, 85% of our energy use is going to come from buildings that exist today. So if you look around you, all these buildings that are here today, they're going to be here in 2030. So if we want to reduce our carbon emissions, we really have to, have to tackle existing buildings, not just focus on new. Um, and the way the city decided to approach this, they, you know, they, had, they went through a lot of hearings and a lot of public debate and had big task forces that involved public officials, developers, bankers, um, co-op board members, and engineers, architects, I mean, you name it, they were involved for, for two years. And they decided that probably the best way to approach this was to um, tackle the large buildings first, because New York has a lot of large buildings. So they decided that buildings uh, greater than 50,000 square feet would be the ones they focus on. And a proxy for that is 50 units or more for residential. Not exact, but it's, it's a good enough proxy. So if you live in a six-unit building, it's not going to affect you. 
If you live in a 25 unit building, it's probably not gonna affect you. If you live in a 70 unit building, it's probably gonna affect you. Um, there's about 22,000 buildings over 50,000 square feet in all five boroughs, and a lot of them are in Manhattan. And two thirds of these are residential. So how will the laws affect you? The uh, building owners, uh, for one thing, will have to benchmark the energy consumption uh, of their buildings for the first time, and I will explain what benchmarking it means in a, in a few minutes. They will also have to do an energy audit and a retro commissioning once every 10 years. And, uh, but the energy audits are gonna provide you with uh, very valuable information, especially if you're in a co-op or a condo, you actually own your unit. You are a building owner, whether you realize it or not, you own that building. So it's in your best interest to reduce the energy costs of that building and to save money where you can. At the same time, you'll be reducing our carbon emissions. So owners will be able to reduce their operating costs. What are the green building laws? There's four that I'm gonna talk about tonight. The first two I'm gonna go over very briefly. Um, the uh, New York City, City Energy Conservation Code is the, is the first one and that affects all buildings. The lighting upgrades and sub-metering uh, primarily affects commercial buildings and the tenants in commercial buildings. Um, but it touches on multifamily buildings and I'll explain that. Benchmarking is gonna affect you if you're in a building over 50,000 square feet, and um, also energy audits and retro commissioning requirement will, will affect you if you live in a large building. Oh, let me go back. Um, you see the LL8509, those numbers, and the letters and numbers under each one? <coughs> that stands for local law. So LL8509 means it's, it's now called Local Law 85, which was passed in 2009. So if you wanna look at these laws, you can um, Google them, like LL8509, or Google Local Law 8509, or you can go to my website, they're all there. Um, you can go to the city's website and find them in the Department of Buildings, or you can go to City Council and find them there. So they're very readily available. So we'll start with the code, LL8509. Um, this amends the New York City Energy Conservation Code. Um, and New York City adapted or adopted the New York State Energy Code of 2007 and it now calls that their own code. So we have our own city code, but it is now more stringent than the New York State Code. And there are a lot of proposals in the works to make it even more sort of green building oriented. But the most important thing that happened when they um, enacted this law in 2009 was they got rid of what we call the 50% loophole which, um, which enabled uh, owners of buildings to not comply with the code if they did a renovation of less than 50% of the building systems. So that's not allowed anymore. So now uh, anything you do to the building is um, required to be code um, compliant. Lighting upgrades and submetering is local law 8809. And um, this involves um, electric uh, meters or submeters uh, that must be installed in uh, commercial tenant spaces or floors over 10,000 uh, square feet. The government is giving uh, commercial owner, building owners until 2025 to comply. This will allow them to um, renew their leases and renegotiate leases a couple of times and build in um, language that, um, uh, you know, um, um, take, uh, takes into account uh, the sub-metering um, and how the tenants will pay. And the tenants will be uh, given statements of their month monthly electrical um, usage. And by the way, just so you understand, everything I'm talking about tonight for um, um, private sector buildings, which is what we live in, are also um, required of city-owned buildings. And the uh, requirements for the city-owned buildings happen faster than for us and uh, also um, for smaller size buildings. So the city is already doing this and has been doing this, this these kinds of upgrades for years. Um, lighting upgrades applies to uh, the base building and the non-residential spaces within multifamily buildings. So in the case of, let's say, a large co-op on the Upper East Side with the Gristides on the ground floor, it's gonna affect Gristides because that is a retail space. If you are in the, you know, the uh, Upper West Side and you have a doctor's office on your lobby, it's gonna affect that office. Um, it's not gonna affect the dwelling units or the spaces serving them, the common areas, the hallways, laundry rooms, boiler rooms, et cetera. 
Um, and the, the um, uh, lighting upgrades, um, to, to, to bring the upgrades up to the energy code standards are going to affect this list of things here. Interior lighting, lighting controls, exterior lighting, tandem wiring, exit signs. I put a picture here of an LED exit sign. This is a very popular item to, uh, to um, uh, become more energy efficient. If you have an exit sign on with incandescent bulbs in it, they usually have two and they're on 24-7, usually they're on all the time. If you switch it to a LED, you're gonna save 20% right there on the, co on the, on the operating costs of that, of that one item. Um, and I said the deadline was 2025, and uh, when you do these upgrades, this all has to be certified by um, a PE is a professional engineer, an RA is a registered architect, or, or a uh, licensed electrician. Yes. That's correct. It excludes, that's correct. But so you just need to be concerned if you have um, commercial tenants, it's gonna affect them. Um, now, the, the, let, me, uh, let me just go back before I show you that really cool picture. The, um, the reason I'm even talking about this with you is not so much that you're required, you know, you're obviously not required to do it, but it's a good thing to do. It, it, in, in some cases, it's a good thing to do. Uh, Mary Fisher did it in her co-op uh, in, in, uh, it's in Queens, right? The Georgetown News, 930, Garden Hills. Hugh Garden Hills, 930 units. And um, it's a complicated thing to do. It's, it's difficult to do. But um, if your building is master metered, you have one meter for the whole building, the only way you can charge people for what they use is through shares or square footage or something like that. It, it's really not fair because you've got people that use a lot of energy and, um, and they don't pay, pay their fair share. Once you submeter, they start to pay their fair share. Um, so it's a good thing to think about, but you don't have to do it. Um, a lighting upgrade can be um, uh, uh, you know, done voluntarily, and um, this one was done on an Upper East Side pre-war co-op. You can see on the left-hand side, the hallway is lit with incandescent um, uh, ceiling fixtures. It's kind of dark and dingy. Um, and they're on 24-7. Those lights are on 24-7. Um, they replace that with soffits in the ceilings and, and uh, CFL light bulbs uh, in the ceiling. And then they also have um, sensors in the hallway. So there are um, occupancy sensors. So when you open up, so, so the lights are not on all the time. The lights are, are uh, they're, they're bi-level lights. So they're on much lower, but to code, when there's no one in the hallway, which is most of the time. And when someone comes up the elevator and the elevator door is open or you open your front door, the lights go on. So it's always brightly, brightly lit if you're in the hallway, but it goes down if you're not in the hallway, and that saves you a lot of money as well. 